Good afternoon, everyone. We have heard so much about uh, security and resilience in all aspects of life, including that of, of health. No? Our approach to understanding resilience is kind of very different, considering that me and my co-author, Dr. Cesar G. Di Mayo, are uh, biologists. No? We try to understand how biology is also able to influence all aspects of the difference, uh, different disciplines studying life. No? Um, the title of the presentation is Resilience and Transformation in Situations of Conflict and Fragility, Repairing Mindanao for Uncertain Times. I'd like to bring the discussion to what we call as, let me first, uh, okay, so, sorry. <laughs> um, what has been discussed earlier are concepts of resilience in health. Our proposal, our recommendation is a one health approach to resiliency with regards to health. Because as biologists, we see that the problems that we have, for example, related to COVID-19 pandemic, has something to do with the health of populations of other forms of organisms other than humans. And so what we see is very important is not only the health, of populations of humans, but also health of populations of animals, whether they're birds, their poultry, etc., wildlife, or even plants. So this is very important to us because we know that there is a transfer of health challenges from one organism to another. And this concept is what we call as zoonosis. So we now see that the, the human beings are not alone in terms of like being challenged to challenge with uh, health um, problems, but also other forms of organisms. And so, for example, there were many assumptions with regards to how COVID-19 arised. It was, uh, there were theories that it came from other forms of organisms, including pangolins, bats, etc. But these are all because we see that there is a link between the human and uh, all other species health. And this is because of the emergence of, of the concept of zoonosis. So in, in Mindanao, our problem is not only that of the problem of producing food and also in terms of security as to the health and well-being of our people, of our population. We have also relevant conflict lines challenging our populations of humans. Now we have uh, the Bangsamoro right to self-determination, the conflict between the government and the CPP and PNDF, resource-based conflicts, inter- and intra-community conflicts, and other forms of shadow economies. Now, so these are all very important to consider when we plan for development of our um, populations. And we see this one as very important because there are studies wherein uh, resiliency comes off very different when you have a population of humans in uh, cities or municipalities that re are relatively peaceful and those that are not um, so peaceful. In the case of Mindanao, because of these conflict lines, one of the ways to be able to address these issues is through economic interventions in the form of livelihood. And some of these interventions, livelihood interventions, are in the form of agriculture, meaning to say uh, to be able to revitalize local economies to address the issue of poverty, which is one of the drivers of conflict and violence you have there. Um, agriculture interventions, we have seen how the government has uh, put up abaca plantations in some of the interior municipalities of Lanao del Norte and Lanao del Sur, just to also address the issue of poverty, now, which is becoming one of the main drivers of conflict and violence in many parts of, of Mindanao. So this is where we are coming from because now the definition of peace, security, prosperity, and resilience comes very differently when you talk about conflict-affected areas. Number one, when you talk about conflict-affected areas, you talk about the root causes of violence and conflict, which is not only limited to understanding enemy images, biases, discrimination, and stereotypes among the different people, but also the root causes of poverty, lack of access to basic services like potable water, reliable food supplies, 
and etc. So these are very important to consider. Now we're going to focus on the issue of of supply of food, no, which is very important to us because you know when you talk about livelihood opportunities here, the context is that most of those that are planted in our conflict affected areas are sources not only of livelihood for the local economy but also sources of food for our populations of people, especially the marginalized sets of populations of people. The concept here is the words adaptability, flexibility, resilience, and legality. And henceforth, our proposal, our recommendation for One Health approach, what we are saying is that the interventions coming from the government in terms of agriculture may fail in the future if we don't also look into the health of the abaca, the different value crops that are being planted in our conflict affected areas no in many parts of the region or in lanao for example the abaca plantations some of them have succumbed to banchita virus no so these are abaca plantations in uh, some of the mi left camps some of the areas that have experienced long history of protected conflict now, so what is happening here is that um, if this government interventions in the form of the abaca plantations would soon fail, then that would add other layers of conflict because that would produce so much emotions in the form of frustrations on the part of the local population. So this is our proposal, the One Health approach. If we're going to look at the relationship or the nexus between climate change, environment, and conflict, it's kind of very complex because in not all situations we're in, there's a failure with regards to food security in fragile contexts. In some other contexts like Somalia, there were incidents when they saw that surprisingly it was able to survive the 2011 food crisis, uh, even though it has um, hit, was affected by conflict and had an effective government since 1991. In other countries, like for example in Haiti, when the earthquake struck in 2010, there was massive impact that was very negative to the local economy and to the health of the population because the earthquake came into the point of Haiti where there was so much poverty, there was so much social exclusion. So this reinforced the social injustices, now very difficult for people to access social services because of the conditions the local conflicts as well. So in this graph, graph number one, we see how there is a relationship between food insecurity and instability. So this is where we're coming from when we are grounding on that the instability in uh, populations of humans, now in our communities, might be reinforced because of food insecurity. And this is the reason why we're proposing for one health approach to resilience, especially with regards to health and food security, because we know that if there would be continued hunger because of, uh, and also poverty because of um, failures in agricultural systems, failures in producing food, this will contribute to further instability. You know? So this will um, challenge the gains of these the, the peace processes here in, in Mindanao. So what we have uh, seen so far is um, there is a limitation to what kind of organisms or commodities that are being used by conflict-affected areas so in rehabilitating and normalizing the lives of people in conflict-affected areas. For example, in uh, Munay, in uh, Camp Bilal, so we see abaca, coconut, and, and rice. But when uh, we see these kinds of data, we only look at very few, very limited opportunities for economic revitalization. But Dr. Demai and I, we saw that if, for example, the communities would just imagine how they're going to utilize their knowledge about healing and traditional medicines, now, we asked them during the times of crisis and wars in the past, where do they go? 
because they could not go to the pharmacies. They subscribe to using local sources of medicines like their food, uh, their, their plants around them. You know? So these are very important information that could be used to feed into um, commercialization of, of products where the local community would be able to benefit. You know? So these are very important to us because uh, the, the health of the local economy really entirely depends on the breadth and richness of the natural resources found in the area. If the people, especially, for example, the Amarila food, only be able to realize the in, immense diversity of natural resources that they could use for economic revitalization, then that is already a step forward towards stability and resilience. However, what we see now is that development plans are anchored on only very few natural resources, like for example, abaca, uh, coconut, and, and rice. No? So that's how... So the One Health approach is something that is important to us because now, as uh, biologists, now Dr. DeMaio and I are population biologists, where Dr. DeMaio is a geneticist, we saw that um, economic interventions in the, form, in the form of of agriculture, if not accompanied by scientific research, would fail. For example, as what was previously mentioned, the abaca plantations, if these would succumb to Banchita virus, would be the, the mortality rates of the siblings would be very high. And this would add another layer of frustrations of the local people against the government. So hence, would be destructive of the gains of the peace process. Now, in the case of invasive species, our studies show that the agricultural systems in parts of Mindanao, for example, in Lanao, we saw widespread invasion of, of species that are not native or indigenous to our uh, localities. Now, for example, the golden apple snail or Pomacea caniliculata, if you look at the structure, these are results of our analysis. Uh, Dr. DeMaio and I are using computational biology in the form of geometric morphometrics to analyze populations of organisms and whether or not they have um, flexibility. Now, they, they have genetic diversity to be able to survive environmental perturbations. The concept in, evo in evolutionary biology, one of the assumptions that we have is that organisms are able to survive perturbations in environmental conditions once they have very high genetic diversity. So what we saw in the golden apple snail or kohol, which is the pomaseco na canaliculata, is that it is able to survive well in new environments, including that of interior parts of Lanao, so that when this attacks the agricultural systems, the interventions, the economic and livelihood interventions that the government has for the local communities of MRLF, then this would succumb, no? the agricultural systems would succumb to the attacks of Pomacea punacaniculata because it's very high genetic diversity. If we're going to look at our studies as well on sources of carbohydrates and proteins, the alternative sources of carbohydrates and proteins, there seems to be limited diversity with regards to the the phenotype of the organisms, which could be serve, which could serve as proxy indicators of the genetic diversity of our food sources. No, if, for example, no, you combine that one, the high genetic diversity and high phenotypic diversity of invasive species attacking our agricultural systems, and the very low genetic diversity of our sources of proteins and carbohydrates, then that would mean instability with, with regards to our food sources. Now, so what we are now really uh, proposing is a One Health approach to um, food security. Um, this is an example of the abaca banchita virus. We have heard of narratives of abaca planted in Kampilal of Munay 
This is uh, Camp Bilal is one of the largest camps. It is the largest camp of the MILF, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in Lanao del Norte. Uh, Camp Bilal straddles between the areas of Lana del Norte and Lanao del Sur. So one of the interventions with regards to the normalization process as part of the peace process between the Bangsamoro and the Philippine government is this abaca. So introducing abaca plantation to revive or to help revitalize the local economy of Munay. However, our fear is that if these populations of abaca would succumb to Banchetta virus because of lack of interventions coming from the academe and the national government agency and the local government units, then this uh, economic intervention as a form of normalization would uh, add uh, fury and frustrations among the people, which is not very good, no, because we know that a part of or result or consequences of the conflicts, violent conflicts in the past, are a lot of emotions, including frustrations, mistrust against the government. So this is also the things that we see at the Institute for Peace and Development in Mindanao that. The normalization process, the economic interventions that the government use to address issues of poverty, which is the driver of conflict and violence on the ground in our communities, the economic intervention should be accompanied by pure research, accompanied by empirical data as to the health of the valuable resources of uh, food and medicine, etc. So this is something that is very important to us. So what we are saying in our One Health approach is that when you talk about resiliency, we couldn't talk only about the health and resiliency of populations of humans. We also have to talk about the health of the bats around us, the birds around us, because if we're not going to look into the health of the birds, populations of birds around us, then you have avian flu, you know, which could not be controlled because of zoonosis. So we have to look into the health of all species of organisms, not only humans, but also other forms of animals and plants around us. Remember, that the fate of the Bangsamoro peace process and other peace processes that we have in Mindanao, uh, especially on the aspect of normalization, relies on the success of the interventions on the ground. If the economic and livelihood interventions would fail because it would succumb to diseases, both emerging and pervasive uh, diseases, then we will have instabilities, we will have uncertain futures. So. Our call now with MSUIT is really collaborate and help with each other as to how we can come up with a sound intervention to help check on the populations and the health of the uh, populations of organisms, not only on human species, but all the species that are around us, whether they're humans, animals, or plants. So I think... Um, MSUIT, is, uh, that is what we're trying to do. And this is the reason why in the Institute for Peace and Development in Mindanao, we have gone to the point of recruiting people from the other disciplines. Personally, I'm a biologist. Dr. DeMaia is also a biologist. We're working on the concept of environmental peace building because we know that one of the major conflict lines in Mindanao is because of resource-based issues. There are conflicts because of competitions for scarce resources. In the future, we think that the resource that is very important for us that could become a driver to conflict and violence are natural resources that are sources of carbohydrates and proteins. So these are sources of food and those resources that are very important for healing, like the traditional sources of active metabolites that could be used for medicine. So these are the things. Now, we are thinking that when we plan for our local development plans, when we have that, when we craft them, we have to think about the future. What kinds of diseases, what kinds of health problems will be confronting our populations? What kinds of new conflict plans would also divide our people on the ground? So there is really this understanding that when we talk about conflict, it's not only conflicts between populations of humans, but also conflicts arising from the resources around us, including attacks of diseases and violent 
um, pervasive uh, spread of infectious diseases. So thank you very much for listening and good afternoon, everyone.